Welcome back to the Data Professor YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is Chinen Nanta Senamad, and I'm an Associate Professor of Bioinformatics. On this YouTube channel, we cover about data science concepts and practical tutorials. So if you're into this type of content, please consider subscribing. Okay, so let's compare between bioinformatics and data science. And so to the left, bioinformatics is aimed at making sense and gaining insights from biological data. And so data science is just more generic term to mean make sense and gain insights from data. And so we can see that bioinformatics and data science are quite similar in the sense that biology is replacing domain knowledge. And so statistics and computer science here are essentially the same. And so the domain knowledge in bioinformatics is essentially biology. Okay, so this is just a crude comparison between both fields and bioinformatics might not entail the use of only machine learning algorithms and there are other parts of bioinformatics that are not accounted for in this simplified comparison. Just a point to note. Okay, so you might ask why do we need computational models for drug discovery. So let's look at some case study of other areas. So computers such as IBM Deep Blue had defeated human beings in Jeopardy and chess. Google released a self-driving car. NASA uses computers to simulate space mission. Computers are being used to design aircrafts and cars. Supermarkets and shopping malls are using purchase history to analyze and predict our spending behavior. For example, the membership card that they give us, they could track our purchase and then analyze the data, for example, by market basket analysis by seeing which products do we normally buy together. And also Amazon Go has made it possible to use AI and face recognition to allow shoppers to just walk in, walk out, right? Just walk in, grab what you need, put it in your bag and just leave. And so with all of these case study in mind, the natural question would be, why not use it for discovering, designing and developing new drugs? And so the thing is, we do. We do use computers for drug discovery. And so the first example is to discern the structure activity relationship of chemical library. And so this means that the chemical structure of compounds or molecules are being correlated to their molecular features, which is a quantitative or qualitative description of the chemical structure. And so such computational models, such predictive models are now being used as alternative to some some experimental work. And a notable example here is the use of deep learning to decode and encode SMILES notation of molecules in order to analyze the structure activity relationship and based on such model, use it to generate new molecules. So this is a very interesting application. And on the right here, we see that there is the PCA analysis or the principal component analysis, which tells the clustering of the active drugs and the inactive drugs, meaning compounds that have good activity toward the target protein and bad activity toward the target protein. So green and red. So green is good, red is bad. Okay, so additional examples. Computational models can be quickly built to predict the pharmacokinetics and bioactivity of query compounds by pharmacokinetic it means the absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity of drugs. And the bioactivity is the inhibition or activation of the target protein. And so the data that you have collected in part one essentially falls into this bullet point, particularly the bioactivity of query compounds. Okay, so the compounds that you have compiled, which inhibit the coronavirus, are compounds that have been tested experimentally to inhibit the protein protein from the coronavirus. And so you could change the name of this target protein to other proteins such as aromatase or other protein that you are interested in. And so the compounds are modulating and by modulating, I mean they are trying to control the target protein by either inhibiting it or to activate it. Okay. And so you could think of these molecule as the on and off switch of the target protein. So when you apply that molecule, you could turn it off or turn it on. 
on in terms of the function of the protein. And so your predictive model using machine learning will allow biologists and chemists to understand the relationship between which molecular feature give rise to the biological activity. And such predictive models can be applied for personalized medicine. And so this figure is an example of the functional group analysis from structure activity relationship model building from one of our papers. Okay, and other specific questions that can be answered by computational models include what target proteins, what target proteins can my compound bind to? And so the target protein could be the aromatase or it could be the protease, it could be the glucosidase, amylase, etc. And so with the target protein of your interest, you want to know which compound or small molecule could come and modulate this target protein activity, either to inhibit or to activate it. And so the second question could be, what type of compound can bind and modulate the bioactivity of the target protein of my interest? And the third question would be, are there any similar compounds to my query compound that may potentially exert similar binding behavior? So let's say that you have a FDA approved drug that has been known to inhibit aromatase enzyme. And you want to know, is there any other small molecule that that have similar structure with this FDA approved drug. And so the reason being that the FDA approved drug might be a good drug, but it might have some side effects that are undesirable. And so the goal of drug discovery and drug design is to develop drugs with minimal side effects. And so that entails the optimization of the pharmacokinetic comprising of the absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, toxicity. Okay, and so it would be interesting to see is there any similar structure to the FDA approved drug that has similar binding effect but with a safer pharmacokinetic profile. And so all of these could be answered by applying machine learning and data science. Okay, and so as we know, data science is the process of identifying and making sense of hidden patterns. And so this hidden patterns could be the knowledge and we try to make sense of the hidden patterns that are found in the large amounts of data. And so typically the data has this hierarchy going from raw unstructured data to becoming more structured data. And then once we structure the data, we could uncover the patterns. And once we have the patterns, we can gain knowledge. And finally, we could apply it to have wisdom. Okay, and so on to QSAR modeling, which stands for Quantitative Structure Activity Relationship Modeling. So this is a mathematical modeling that tries to find relationship between chemical structure structure and the bioactivity or the biological activity. And so the chemical structure could be represented by a set of molecular descriptors, which could be quantitative or qualitative. And the molecular descriptor will be about the physical chemical properties of the molecule. The molecular descriptor could either be global features or local features. By global meaning molecular weight at the holistic level. And local features could mean like the small minute detail like the functional groups, hydroxy group, nitrogen atoms, or the charge of specific portion of the molecule. Okay, so I'm going to cover that more in the subsequent video tutorials where we generate the molecular descriptor. And so I'm going to tell you which one are the global features and which ones are the local features. And so this is the workflow of the QSAR modeling or QSAR modeling. And so this is from the first review article that I have written back in 2009. So it was my first review article, which I wrote about the QSAR modeling. So you could copy this and paste it into Google to read more details about it or I could also provide it in the description down below and I could also provide it in the video description so you could check that out and another similar terminology related to the QSAR modeling would be proteochemometric modeling and so I'm not going to go into much detail about this it's more advanced which would be better to save for future videos as well. And so let's think of the proteochemometric model as several QSAR models combined together. Okay, so that's the essential concept of the PCM. So we're going to skip it for now. And so this is the holistic level of all of the resources and tools available for drug discovery at the holistic level. And so this is from one of my editorial articles. And this is a summary of the procedures for the development of the QSAR model 
model. So it's essentially the development of machine learning models. And when we use machine learning to make sense of this chemical data, biological data, we change the name to QSAR. But it's essentially machine learning model. So as you can see, we have data collection, biological data collection. We generate the descriptor, feature generation, feature selection, data pre-processing, splitting of the data to training and test set, validating the model internally and develop the model and performing evaluation of the model performance and also to perform external validation on an external set. Okay, and so this is a list of the chemical databases and the list of molecular descriptor software. And so for future tutorial videos of this bioinformatic project series, we're going to use free software or open source software. So no worry that you have to buy expensive software for following along. So we're going to make use of the open source software. And this is a list of the computational chemistry software. So don't worry about that. So back in 2016, we organized the first international conference on pharmaceutical bioinformatics. So it was a collaboration collaboration with Uppsala University. So we bring together enthusiasts of drug discovery and design. And so this was the poster advertisement for the conference and yours truly. And so the question here is, why do we need to develop our own bioinformatics tool? So you might notice that there might be several thousands of bioinformatic tools that are already in existence. So do we think that all possible tools would have already been developed? What do you think? Is it true or false? So let me know in the description and we could discuss about this. And the second question is bioinformatics tools will be available forever. Will it be available forever? Let me know in the comments, true or false. Existing tools may lack certain features that we need in our own project. What do we do? Do we develop our own tools or do we proceed without this feature? So just go ahead and ignore the feature that we wanted. Okay, so some more questions for you. Which path will you take? Will you hire a programmer to develop the bioinformatics tool or will you learn how to program? Okay, so there's two possible answers. So let me know in the comments down below which is your answer. So these are selected web servers and software that we have developed in our research group. And so these software, as you can see, are all related to bioinformatics. And the first one was wrapping the Weka software inside Python in order to automate the development of neural network models and support vector machine models. So actually we built this back in early 2010 or 11. And it was a time when no automatic ML was available. And so perhaps it was among one of the first automated data mining software. And the software here was mentioned in one of the book chapters published by Springer in the book Artificial Neural Network. And we also developed other bioinformatic web server, including OSFP, CryoProtect, Hemopred, BioCurator, and PyBat. And so our research group are practicing research reproducibility, whereby we try to share the code and data that were used to prepare the analysis in the papers that we publish so that other interested users can reproduce the work and perhaps make use of it in their own research. And these are some of the book chapters and review articles that we have contributed. And so this is the bonus that I was talking about earlier on, which is the steps to developing a bioinformatic tool. And so as you can see, essentially there is six steps. And so the first step would be to come up with the concept of the bioinformatics tool. So you want to figure out what bioinformatic tool or software that you want to develop. And normally the idea for the bioinformatic tool will come from an unsolved problem that you might have, or it might be an inconvenience to your project that you figure out would be an interesting topic to explore further. For example, it could be a problem or something that might slow down your analysis. And if you are able to solve that by means of developing a bioinformatic tool, then it could not only save your time, but other people's time as well. Okay, so coming up with the concept of the bioinformatic tool could come from the problems that you encounter. And so once you come up with the tool, you want to make a list of the features that you want 
to see. So make a wish list of the features. And so step number three is to list the sequential workflow methodology, meaning the protocol or the pseudocode of the bioinformatic tool, like step one, step two, step three. What do you do? How do you pre-process the data? Okay. And so step number four is that you have to realize that bioinformatics tool are essentially a collection of small tasks, meaning that if you click on one button, it will invoke a particular task. It could be performed by a particular function that you develop. And if you click on another button, it will perform another function, right? So it is essentially a collection of tasks. And so you weave it together to get this software. And so step number five is you want to work on the coding of each of these small tasks individually. And so let's think of it as like a chapter in a book. Right? So many chapters will comprise a book. So you will work on individual chapters and within no time, you will be able to complete all of the chapter to form the entire book. And so the last step is to make sure that the entire workflow work as desired. Okay, so this is about testing, about debugging. So you wanna try from the beginning, right? You wanna input the data and see whether it provides the desirable intermediate data and the output data, which is the final data right okay and so if you find value in this video please give it a thumbs up and if you haven't yet subscribed please subscribe to the channel and as always the best way to learn data science is to do data science and please enjoy the journey thank you for watching please like subscribe and share and i'll see you in the next one but in the meantime please check out these videos